will be given by Glenda Halliday. Glenda is a, an expert scientist and has served the society in many ways with some really gloriful lectures that I have, uh, I still remember. Glenda is going to speak on clues to disease mechanisms from the types and patterns of cellular pathologies in the brain. Glenda, welcome, sincerely. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, I hope I can do justice to that, <laughs> to that introduction. Uh, I'm extremely honoured uh, to be giving this lecture. I must admit, at all the meetings I've been at, my heroes usually give this lecture. And uh, I really didn't imagine that I'd ever be invited, so thank you very much. It's a great, great honour. So I thought that I'd start by thanking people, um, primarily because I think at the end I'd forget. Um, I'll just say that I have no disclosures that are relevant to the talk. Um, you heard a fantastic lecture by Professor Rajput, and um, both of us have probably have to acknowledge that the research participants and their families who commit themselves to these longitudinal studies that include brain for, um, donation, um, we have to be really grateful to. Um, most, most times we don't have that and we learn so much from. And I hope that my talk um, will follow on um, Ali's talk and actually show you how much we can learn from brain donation and autopsy. The research isn't possible without funding. And like everything, if you do this type of work, it really does involve a big team. And I've only put a fraction of those that I've worked with over the years. The other thing that I would have to say that coming to these meetings and having many discussions with both junior and senior members at this particular meeting has actually driven a lot of some of the questions that I've tried to answer over the years. And so for that, I'm very, very grateful. Um, my talk is going to be um, an outline at the beginning where I try to actually tell you about how you might use observational studies on neuropathology to answer different types of questions. And so I'll go through what types of studies that we can do and what they can tell us. I'll then talk through some of the data that have actually been um, uh, from my work and some from others, um, looking at the regional amounts of tissue loss and this we can actually do longitudinally because you can image people during life and then look at the atrophy in a very similar way at autopsy. It's not commonly done because to do that you do need whole brains. And uh, as you just heard, um, cutting them in half can be problematic. I'll then talk to you through the neurons that actually degenerate and for clinical practice, the ones that you want to concentrate on are those that actually happen early. What is it that's happening when you see those patients when they first come into the clinic? Now, the autopsy studies on those types of patients are rare because patients then have to die of an, an unrelated disease so that we can see that, and I'll concentrate on that. Um, most people, and, and we've become a, a type of neurodegeneration has turned into talking about protein deposition, which is extremely important. And so I will talk to you about that and the different types of studies, both the population-based studies and the longitudinal studies. Then I'll try and talk to you about how we might look at the intracellular uh, formation of the Lewy bodies, which are extremely important for Parkinson's disease. I'll speculate and show you data on different pathological forms of alpha-synuclein and completely speculate on cell-to-cell -cell transmission and you'll hear a lot of other fantastic symposium speakers on that. I want to end with observations on alpha-synuclein and protein changes in glia. Um, it seems to me that it's something that's forgotten and um, hopefully it may stimulate some of the next generation of clinicians and scientists to look more closely at this area and then wrap up. So what, can neuro, what type of studies can we do with neuropathology? And the first thing is, is you only ever get a snapshot. And each of the brains that you look at is relatively unique. They're regionally heterogeneous. And if you think about looking at, at the lecture theatre or your colleagues and how different every individual is, the brain is exactly the same. So when you get one, they all look quite different. 
We can only assess what's happening in the brain at one time point, and that's a problem because we talk about what happens over time from neuropathological data. So I'll come back to that. But there is no other way at the moment to actually um, assess any changes at the cellular and molecular level. Um, we can only do it from brain tissue. And so it's extremely important because if we're going to model the disease, we actually have to have the information. The diseases that affect the brain, everyone knows they actually affect certain regions more than others. And that's what gives us our uh, syndromes th uh, that we see clinically. But within each region, usually they affect select cells. And we'll spend some time on, on that. So a whole region is affected, uh, but within that, only certain cells. So if we think about the ways that we can look at the um, neuropathological data, um, many studies, in fact, most studies are done at what we would call a population level. And that's where you take a snapshot of all the autopsy samples that you have at that time point, and you can look at large numbers of cases, and you can access the different patterns and mechanisms. To do that, you use standard sampling of critical brain regions, and you uh, do record extractions um, and limit of a limited number of features, usually either pathologically or clinically. So I put this cut slide there of a snapshot of people that are watching a sporting event. And actually looking at these sorts of studies, it's extremely similar to that. You've captured a population at that time point, and then you look at particular features in that population. Um, so for example, if we were thinking that Lewy body severity was color coded by different t-shirts, you'd look at this population and say, what's similar about all the people that have white t-shirts versus darker t-shirts? And then that's actually how you would look at the uh, variability in some of the, the features, like some of them have hats and some of them have sunglasses. And you actually feature extract from a population that is snapped in time. So that's most neuropathological studies are done on larger populations in this way. Then we have the other way of looking at it where you actually look at clinical cohorts. And to do this, you have targeted groups for comparison. Now, when you do that, you can still do the same population like of uh, feature extraction, or you can do what you heard in that first lecture today by um, Ali, uh, the beautiful longitudinal following and then you actually have a look at what's um, happened at the end. And that's much more similar to clinical practice and much more similar to how, um, as uh, clinicians, you would actually um, be thinking of the data. But it's not the most uh, published sets of data. It's usually more uh, population-based. Now, what we really would like to do is look at an individual and actually be able to predict what's happening pathologically in vivo. And of course, at the moment, we can't do that. And so uh, looking forward to when this breakthrough comes through where we can actually have in vivo biomarkers that would look at that. So for this talk, I'm going to concentrate on those longitudinally followed cohorts, very similar to our first speaker. I'm going to try and assess people at the different clinical stages and present averages uh, so that you, you'll know that there are people in between that I won't be talking about. Within each brain, you can assess regions that are primarily affected, less affected, or not affected at all. So even within an individual, you get informative information about all the disease process. And within each region, as I told you, select neurons are affected. So you can look at those that are affected versus those that are less affected versus those that are not affected. So we can, we can gain information um, from each region as well as to how the disease is pro progressing in that region. So starting with comparative atrophy, and um, if we look at different samples of um, uh, cohorts, and clinically you know that uh, patients that have Parkinson's disease generally have less atrophy, uh, with MRI, and the difference between the data I'm showing you is that I've measured the atrophy in pure populations which have known pathology. 
So in patients that have Parkinson's disease and don't get any other neurodegenerative disease, there is really at autopsy very limited atrophy. Um, if they have coexisting other disease, they actually generally have more atrophy. <coughs> so, um, so Parkinson's disease, in fact, uh, at autopsy, we can measure very little uh, change in, the, in brain tissue structures. And that happens with a disease that actually is a fairly long disease compared to other degenerative diseases. So I point out at the moment that suggests it's an interesting disease, but a disease we could treat if that's the only pathology they have because it doesn't actually get rid of a lot of the tissue. And interestingly, one thing both, uh, I've put these on time scales so that you can see the average ages of onset, um, but if gene genetics makes, not only does age, but genetics makes a difference in these diseases. And so I just highlight that if you have a gene um, effect in Alzheimer's disease, it generally pulls it so you have an earlier age of onset, but the disease is relatively similar, similar both in terms of uh, the disease durations, but also the types of pathologies that are uh, featured. In Parkinson's disease, it's interesting if you have genetic forms, and particularly the um, um, non-dominant forms, they shift again the age of onset earlier, um, but the disease actually goes for a longer time. And so that's a very different type of disease. So Parkinson's disease is an interesting disease. The atrophy in patients that have no other degenerative condition is relatively modest. And genetics makes a difference, but it actually drags the disease longer and has a more indolent course in general. As I said to you, if we actually take those populations and actually look at only those patients that died of a different uh, cause of disease in the first five years, for example, then really the targeted neuronal populations are, are focused. So each of the diseases actually produces the clinical syndrome because they really do target certain uh, neurons for degeneration. So in Parkinson's disease, you all know it's the dopamine neurons and you have very little in the first few uh, years, you have very little other neuronal populations that are largely affected. In, in multiple system atrophy, it's different. It's basal ganglion cerebellum, and it's much more widespread. You have motor neurons in motor neuron disease. You have focused cortical uh, pyramidal neurons in frontotemporal dementia, hippocampal neurons in Alzheimer's disease, and that's how we get the syndromes, because the neurons that are affected very early are focused. Selective neuronal targeting, and these suggest that each of these would have very different disease mechanisms. Now, in Parkinson's disease, another thing that you probably realize is that the clinical symptoms relate to this restricted neuronal cell loss. Um, it's a number of studies, and I only highlight a few of them, that the UPDRS uh, related uh, in um, relates to rigidity and bradykinesia. Um, the loss of substantia nigra relates to rigidity and, and bradykinesia using the UPDRS scores. And um, as I said, there's a number of studies that have shown this site sort of um, data. So at onset, there's actually a loss of dopamine cells. It relates to particular clinical features, which are core to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and this is something is why the treatment with dopamine actually is effective. So I hope from the data, very short amount of data I've shown, that you know now that selective neuronal loss, I had, didn't show you, but it's usually substantial. Uh, you heard that in some of the previous talks. More than 50% of neurons are necessary to actually have an effect, and that's in most of those areas for most of those diseases that I've talked about. And the amount of degeneration of those neuron, select neuron groups, actually relates to clinical severity. And this suggests that substantial preclinical loss of those neuron population is occurring. So in addition to thinking about preclinical uh, protein deposition, we need to think about preclinical neuron loss. <coughs> 
The neuron loss is regionally focused, usually a single cell type within those regions. For example, the substantia nigra has both GABAergic and dopaminergic neurons, but only the dopamine neurons are affected, and even the dopamine neurons in nearby areas are not affected. So it's a very uh, targeted and single cell type um, effect, and this would suggest that there's selective vulnerability because there's a very targeted process within a region. I didn't present this data, but you should realize that you can have um, cell loss, the selective cell loss, in an absence of the pathological protein deposition. I'm going to go through the protein deposition in a little while. But most patients that have Parkin mutations or, cer or certain LARC2 mutations actually have, very li uh, have no protein deposition, but they have the cell loss in the dopamine neurons. And this mechanistically shows that the processes that involved in neuronal cell loss can be independent of processes that are involved in protein deposition. So coming to the protein deposition, and the first thing I wanted to say, and most important thing, is that both age and genetics make a big difference to protein deposition. Now, I will, I don't know if, is there a, there's no pointer. There, okay. You'll have to, usually I point so I can make this the point. <laughs> These are normal, in all of us and in the large population series, the proteins that are most commonly depositing in the brain is actually the phosphorylated tau protein and the uh, uh, beta amyloid protein. Now, I hope in the uh, graph on the left-hand side, if you go to the 50% uh, of the population and have a look at where you might see the age of 50% uh, of the population that has some tangle formation, it's around the age of 50. So if you look through this room, there's actually quite a high proportion of people that may be making tangles right now, including myself. And, um, and by uh, over 70, it's nearly ubiquitous. So it's something that we can all look forward to, a few tangles hopefully in a few critical regions that aren't going to make a difference. But tangle formation is something that is extremely age-related and um, occurs much earlier than people had imagined previously. Now, if you're going to have a disease that has tangles, you get a lot of them. And I'm talking in Alzheimer's disease in the cortex. Uh, more than in the hippocampus, nearly every neuron has it. And in the cortex, 50% of the pyramidal neurons have it. So um, that's not what happens with aging. With aging, you get a few. And um, it's, it, but it's a protein that normally deposits, and you can all look forward to it, I hate to tell you. So protein deposition is something that we should think of that is age-related. Now, the same happens with the amyloid. Not everyone gets it, but at 50% of the population, it's around 70% have some amyloid deposition. And so if you're doing any studies on, fa on people over the age of 70, amyloid is something that may be there and is something that is pot potentially more normal than we might think. It might predispose to Alzheimer's disease, but a lot of people will have it um, anyway. So these are two uh, of the proteins that deposit, and they, they deposit relatively uh, frequently with age, and the age is between 50 and 70 for 50% of the population to have it. Um, so now I wanted to talk about Parkinson's disease and how we might think of the protein depositions in Parkinson's disease, of course, alpha-synuclein, which I'll come to. I wanted to talk about it from uh, the, both the population-based perspective as well as from the clinical perspective. And so these are some of the cartoons that I've drawn from the Sydney multicenter uh, study uh, uh, cohorts that we did. Now, if you were actually in your clinic, you'd be seeing the patients at various ages in your clinic. So you see people that are younger and people that are older at one time point. So your clinic populations are mixed. And as I said, at, at autopsy, we see the populations usually around the same time. They're usually fairly old. And so the durations of the patients uh, and their age of onset will actually vary considerably. And 
I told you, I hope you remember from the neuronal loss, that when you see these people in the clinic, they all have substantial loss of dopamine neurons already. So that's uniform and it happens early. And then the things that happen that actually change those durations are more to do with progressive pathology over time, which is not necessarily the dopamine loss which they already have. Some of them also have, they all have at least subclinical cholinergic deficit some of them will have even more marked. So cell loss at the beginning is actually uniform and then at the end they all look relatively similar pathologically but to get there is quite different in time. So then if you think about the timing of the Lewy body pathology they all have cell loss, they all do have Lewy bodies. So even if somebody died six months into uh, Parkinsonian features, if they have Parkinson's disease, uh, they will have the Lewy bodies in the brainstem. And as I said at the end, they all look relatively similar. They have cortical Lewy bodies if they go to end stage. But the infiltration of the Lewy bodies is actually uh, stereotypic, as Brach has shown us. And in our autopsy study in Sydney, it, we replicated that in the clinical population. But it actually happens over a different time frame. Some happen slowly and some happen fast. And that's largely related to the age of onset. The other thing that actually modifies the trajectory is the Alzheimer pathology, which I hope from that first slide on protein deposition, you remember, is also related to age. And so if we look at population-based studies, and so on the uh, left um, bottom, uh, you, the more recent study by the Toledo group, which is a large cohort of patients, where they selected the patients that came to autopsy if they had Lewy bodies. And uh, you'll see that if they have Lewy bodies, there's a great lot of them that will have Alzheimer's disease. Now, I don't believe that those would be in the clinics that you see, a, a, a typical movement disorder, Parkinson's clinic. So in Parkinson's disease clinics, we see more of the people that start with the movement disorder, uh, which is on the right-hand side of the population graph. Um, so if we now superimpose the amyloid on top of the uh, um, Parkinson's cohorts, you'll see that those that have a later age of onset nearly always have already got amyloid. And so if they die very early, we see amyloid, we see tangles often, but we see lots of Lewy bodies. So that if they're in that older, the older the age of onset, the more likely there is to be mixed pathology in these populations. And they will actually then have a different clinical course. They have more than one disease. Uh, they actually have an amyloid as well as a synuclein disease. So um, it makes a difference to the age of onset and the amount of Alzheimer pathology makes a real difference to the uh, severity and the tempo of the diseases that you're seeing. So what uh, everyone always asks, what are the clinical features of the synuclein deposition? Now, uh, the associations are not very great. Uh, first off, the cell loss is not related to the amount of synuclein in the regions that have cell loss. Um, and that's disappointing, uh, but it's what ha that's true. The cortex, there is some direct relationships. The, um, uh, the amount of synuclein deposition relates to the severity and, and even the presence of visual hallucinations. Um, there's many references that have shown that. It also relates to the severity of the dementia, and those two things are probably related. So that the, the, in terms of the cortical synuclein, there seems to be relationships. Um, but there is no relationship at the moment uh, with any of the other features that are seen that are thought to be more preclinical, like autonomic uh, dysfunction, uh, autonom uh, sorry, autonomic dysfunction, olfactory dysfunction, sleep disturbances and gait and balance problems. If you look at those regions that are thought to be affected or just in general look at the severity of Lewy bodies, it's not predictable who will have those features and not in the regions. It's not predictable the ones that have more severe would have those features or not. 
So the Lewy bodies don't seem to relate to any of the clinical features that we might predict, particularly the early clinical features uh, that actually uh, dominate uh, what we would consider is Parkinson's disease rather than the dementia phenotype. So I hope that my quick whip through protein deposition, that you've understood that age would play a major role in protein deposition. And this mechanistically suggests that aging itself predisposes to protein deposition, which we now know, rather than neuronal loss per se. Um, as I said, hopefully you will all re now realize that you may be doing protein deposition as we speak, but hopefully it doesn't kill any neurons. That's what we're hoping. But there is a substantial population burden of beta amyloid and tau accumulation, and particularly over the age of 70, you can expect 50% of the people that are coming to see you to have it. Um, but that's not the same for alpha-synuclein. Mechanistically, this suggests that alpha-synuclein is more disease-related or associated. And then unlike that focal neuronal loss, the, the patients that walk in will all have it, that have Parkinson's, the tempo of the alpha-synuclein deposition varies substantially, with, particularly with the age of onset. You have a much slower course with earlier onset. Mechanistically, this shows that those people that have early onset, they do have Lewy bodies, and those neurons can survive a very long time because it goes for longer in those patients that have Parkinson's disease with synuclein deposition. So I now thought I'd show you, if you're looking within the regions, the single region, you can see Lewy bodies forming in an individual person at different stages. So this is a neuron that I will call uh, a normal neuron, and it has pigment in it, which means I know it's a dopamine neuron, and it was taken from a, the substantia nigra of someone who didn't have Parkinson's disease. So this is what a normal dopamine neuron would look like. It's stained for phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, and normal neurons have very little phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, although you can, if I stained for synuclein, I'd see synuclein in the cytoplasm. So my cartoon down below shows my distribution of synuclein, which is all through the neuron, and particularly at the synapse, which you can't see for this neuron because I'm in the substantia nigra. And we'll go through what happens to the synuclein as it's forming a Lewy body, and I'll show you that in the, in the picture above using phosphorylated synuclein. Now in the other half of the brain that we do take and, and freeze, we can actually look at the same regions biochemically, and I'll show you what happens biochemically at different stages of these um, formation of Lewy bodies. So the first thing I'd say biochemically is we have uh, about two to one, the um, synuclein is mainly in the cytosol, there's twice as much, but there's actually also synuclein associated with membranes, and I've stuck them on top of mitochondria and vesicles and things like that within the cells. Then the first thing that you see, if you actually have phosphorylated synuclein, which sees the more abnormal form, is that it forms puncta within the actual neuron. I hope you can see the small, uh, dark, we have the pigment on the bottom end of that cell and up the top you can see the nuclein now starting to form little puncta. Now it's not a single puncta, there's puncta all through that neuron and in fact there's a dendrite that's sticking out going towards the top and you can even see a little puncta in the dendrite there. So puncta is not a single uh, little puncta, uh, you actually have a distributed uh, um, collection of these uh, things through the neuron and through the axon and dendrites. Then what happens is those puncta coalesce and they coalesce into what we call loosely packed filaments and these filaments you can still see within there some, um, I hope you can see some of the organelles that are within that. So these are loosely packed filaments uh, but the synuclein actually starts to coalesce. And then they actually 
at that, that stage they can start to incorporate ubiquitin. And for a previous to having antibodies to alpha synuclein, we used to look at the inclusions with ubiquitin, and this would have been the first stage that we would have been able to see the inclusions using older methods. And probably the first stage, even with the silver staining and the methods of the early histology, would be this stage of the disease. And at this stage, we call them pale bodies because they don't have a structure. And then over time, they compact down, and I hope you can see radiating filaments, and in that cell you can see a big uh, Lewy body that's mature and even a smaller one that's maturing with these radiating filaments. And at this stage we call them uh, mature, um, mature Lewy bodies. So biochemically, what else is changing? Well, the... Um, solubility of the synuclein has changed. So instead of having it predominantly in the cytoplasm, now we actually have more of it stuck to membranes and even into these aggregates. So we get a change of solubility. Now it's a change of solubility. The cell doesn't have more synuclein, and so you lose soluble synuclein and you gain membrane synuclein. So, so whether or not some of the problems with Parkinson's as a loss of soluble is still uh, something that we probably need to pursue. The other thing that happens to the synuclein biochemically is we go from the normal situation where there's very little synuclein that's phosphorylated to at the pre lewy body stage before you actually, those little puncta, at that stage nearly all of it is phosphorylated. And so there's a big shift in, in biochemistry of the synuclein, and that happens really early before you actually start to get the puncta. The other thing that happens at those stages is you actually also get a number of other uh, intracellular proteins that are changing. You get reduced glucose cerebrosidase, and you've heard about the GBA mutations that predispose to Parkinson's disease. You get a, a loss of many of the autophagy pro proteins. So that all occurs in association with this increased phosphorylation. So in the, between the normal and the pre lewy body, there's a number of biochemical aspects of the cells that are changing in patients with Parkinson's disease before you form the lewy bodies. Now the other thing I would say is from the data that we have from the longitudinal studies, and if we think that BRAC staging um, occurs, and as I said, in our Sydney Malta Centre study, we, um, in our clinical populations, we could see that it did progress in a similar fashion. If you take areas that you think are going to have the Lewy bodies and you look at how long does it take for 50% of the population to have uh, limbic Lewy bodies or cortical Lewy bodies, and it takes, on average, over 10 years. In fact, in the Sydney Malta Centre, it was 13 years for um, all 50% of the population to have limbic Lewy bodies. So that suggests that the average duration to actually have Lewy bodies form in these regions is quite a long time in people that have pure synuclein Parkinson's disease. So that brings me to the cell-to-cell -cell transmission because using the BRAC staging suggests that there's a pathology that's progressing and uh, going between regions in cases. And this kind of concept, as you all know, was really cemented when uh, transplanted dopamine neurons in the brains of patients were found to have Parkinson's disease if the transplants had survived more than 10 years. And we would have known that these neurons could not have actually had Parkinson's disease because they were from uh, fetal transplants. We now know from then, since then it's been a rapid field that's progressing, that alpha-synuclein is released from neurons via several mechanisms, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that later. And the mechanism of uptake cell types involved and the amount required is actually under current very active uh, research, and so I'm sure that we'll hear a lot more of that in the future. So um, this brings to the question, is the uh, alpha-synuclein only ever produced in the individual, externally derived, and we heard that fortunately you can't catch it from your spouse, which is fantastic. Um, and 
The, we have been uh, we've been talking about that this nucleon is different in uh, multiple system atrophy to uh, Parkinson's disease, and I'd like to go through a little bit of the data on different conformations and strains. Now, keep one of the things that's in the literature and that I'd, I'd like you to keep in mind is that whenever we talk about alpha-synuclein and, and this transfer, we only ever think of transfer between neurons. And I think that's a mistake, um, and hopefully I'll present some of the data from the humans that would suggest that might be a mistake. But neuron, tr neuron transmission is actually important, but I think, particularly with multiple system atrophy, where the majority of the inclusions are in the oligodendroglia, that we should be broadening our concepts of how transmission between cells occurs. Okay, this has stopped working. Ah. So, um, the concept is, is whether or not the transmission, once it gets into the brain, is it non-selective or selective? Does selective vulnerability actually have a role? Now, I hope that I've, I've told you that uh, in every patient, within every brain region, usually there's only a single type of neuron affected. And so the human data would tell us that there must be some reason that within one region, not all the neurons are affected if it was actually going to be non-selective. That in itself suggests that there must be some selective vulnerability in actually targeting that population for the abnormal protein deposition. Now even within the cell type that's affected, usually only a small proportion of those neurons are targeted. So on average, in the substantia nigra in many of the brain stem regions, uh, a very small proportion of the neurons actually contain these inclusions. Uh, much less so than in the aggregates of tau or much less brain involved than in beta amyloid. And that will be some of the problems we'll have with trying to image these in ligands because it's not as uh, broadly a problem in these, in these populations as in the uh, ones we currently have imaging ligands for. Now those two pieces of data would actually suggest that mechanistically there must be some selective vulnerability um, to this disease particularly. Now if you're, uh, uh, there is no human data on actually the mechanism of transmission and we will have to rely on cellular and animal data to actually understand those aspects. Uh, human data is a snapshot in time and so mechanisms of how it got there is really something that can only be answered um, in, the, in the laboratories at present. What will be important is that it's uh, in the laboratories that some of the human data on what happens is actually modelled correctly so we can interpret appropriately. So I did want to spend a little bit of time because we've talked about alpha-synuclein, to make sure that you realise that alpha-synuclein, uh, one form is different to another. So if you're thinking of uh, um, diseases and alpha-synuclein is the same, uh, the processes are much more likely to be different. I'll go through some of the data. Well, the most obvious data, and you hopefully all know this, is that the cells that are involved in the different synucleinopathies, multiple system atrophy is different to uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, the photomicrograph on the left is from a patient with Parkinson's disease showing the aggregates of synuclein in a neuron and the photos on the right show the aggregates of synuclein in the oligodendroglia of multiple system atrophy. So there's a really obvious difference and the inclusions are found in, in quite different cell types. I'll point out, and this is sort of the density as well, in that field, we've got a number of neurons and only one of them has the uh, Lewy bodies, which is absolutely typical. And you'll see in the multiple system atrophy, a lot of oligodendroglia have it. So the other thing that the glia have is that usually there's many more of them that are involved. So the neurons that get the inclusions and the protein uh, depositions is usually much uh, lower in number than the glia. So the different cell types are involved. The other thing is that the levels of alpha-synuclein and their phosphorylation patterns are different. That tells us there is different mechanisms that are actually at play here. So on the uh, left-hand side, you can see blots from Parkinson's patients, and you can see at the top 
uh, controls versus uh, um, monomeric soluble synuclein, and then at the bottom some of the phosphorylation patterns. In Parkinson's disease, the phosphorylation patterns look very different to those in multiple system atrophy. And at the top, the amount of protein is actually uh, reduced that's soluble. As I said, it becomes more insoluble. Now, it's not the same, and in the basal ganglia, in at least two of those patients with multiple system atrophy, you can see more protein in the blots, and that's more usual. So there's an increased amount. There's a different phosphorylation pattern, which tells us that the process is different, and there's a different in mounds. Alpha synuclein in multiple system atrophy, there's much more of it, uh, and that doesn't happen in Parkinson's. It changes its solubility. You get less soluble, more insoluble. Um, the increased amount of alpha synuclein in MSA is also not just in the brain. There was a fantastic paper in, in brain by Tong et al. in 2010, but there's now shown that there's increased amounts of it in CSF, and also you can measure it in the plasma. So it's actually um, more of it uh, compared to Parkinson's. So this is not working very well. Okay. So in terms of the only, the, my foray into um, looking to see whether or not it transmits is with um, Stan Prusnia's group. We sent over um, material from p patients that had multiple system atrophy and patients that had Parkinson's disease. And fortunately, the <laughs> patients that had Parkinson's disease, he couldn't get uh, the synuclein uh, that he had extracted, his extracts from the brain, to actually transmit in the same uh, model. So the conclusion from that is that it's not very transmittable, the Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's the same as synuclein extracted from control that we sent over as well. But to my horror, uh, the synuclein that he extracted from multiple system atrophy did transmit in his animal model. He uh, uh, replicated it, and then from the animals that he got the disease in, he took the brains of those animals, extracted the synuclein, and that transmitted into the next animal population. And those are the types of experiments uh, that he did to prove uh, prion disease in um, prion. So it suggests that there really is something different about the synuclein in multiple system atrophy to Parkinson's disease, Lewy body synuclein, and that there it has a propensity to actually be able to be transmitted between uh, cells in the brain more, particularly in certain uh, experimental paradigms. So I hope that I've shown you that the synuclein behaves differently in Parkinson's disease to multiple system atrophy. Multiple system atrophy has more cell loss and more cells that are affected by the synuclein pathology. Uh, the pattern of protein deposition is not reflective of the major terminal field uptake, and I didn't show you the data. That's actually from animal studies. But the pattern in multiple system atrophy does uh, reflect connections between the major white matter tracts. The pattern of protein deposition does not reflect major innovation of neurons or based off on animal studies. And so I would suggest that potentially glia are involved, and I'll spend a very small amount of time on that. So obviously, I've shown you that glia are involved in multiple system atrophy, and you can see the oligodendroglia here with the synuclein. They're definitely involved, and there's a lot of them. On the right, the, the micrographs here are of synuclein in a patient that has Parkinson's disease, and this is synuclein in astrocytes, and it's in a region of the cortex which has Lewy bodies. And you'll see that there's a lot of astrocytes that have synuclein in, in them. They don't have the fibrilliform, um, but they definitely have an increased amount of synuclein. So I'll spend a little bit of time on the uh, microglia and the astrocytes because we've talked already about oligodendroglia. Um, first off, microglia are actually affected in Parkinson's disease. We all know that. And the amount of reactive microglia actually relates to how much synuclein the neurons have. And so that's actually, uh, there's a direct relationship here. The microglia are the immune systems of the, uh, the immune, resident immune cells, and so there's definitely an immune component. It happens at the onset in regions that have synuclein. Astrocytes, on the other hand, 
uh, usually react to a protein deposition in the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, in the areas that have the protein deposition, there isn't a big reaction of in the astrocytes, which is really unusual. If you have a coexisting Alzheimer's disease, they react beautifully. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the onset, these um, astrocytes already have an increase in synuclein. And in areas which have Lewy bodies, more astrocytes have synuclein than the cells, the neurons. So there's quite a lot. The phagocytic microglia, the ones that actually could do damage to neurons and astrocytes, actually relate to the degree of synuclein in astrocytes rather than in the neurons. So the synuclein will activate microglia if it's in neurons, but if you get it in astrocytes, it changes the morphology of the microglia to being uh, more destructive morphology. So I'd like to say glia are involved at the clinical onset. There's more glia that contain alpha-synuclein in patients compared to neurons. And mechanistically, this suggests that cell-to-cell -cell transmission of alpha-synuclein occurs more readily in or through glia. The type of glia involved differ. Parkinson's disease has astrocytes and multiple system atrophy has oligodendroglia. And the different glia would actually suggest they interact with different parts of the neurons. The astrocytes contacts neuronal synapses and cell bodies. The oligodendroglia contact axons. Mechanistically, this suggests that different disease processes or processes of transmission potentially impact on these neurons in these diseases. So I'll, I'll end there. The patterns of cell loss and protein deposition actually differ at onset, and that's in every degenerative disease. Mechanistically in Parkinson's, it suggests that there's a multi-site process and that the processes may be different that drive those different the cell loss versus the protein. The cell loss and tissue loss is highly selective and syndrome specific. That suggests it's a very focused targeted process. Age and genetic makeup impact significantly on protein deposition, particularly in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the amyloid and tau deposition with age is over 50% of the population will have it over the age of 70 and it modifies the regional pattern and tempo of alpha-synuclein deposition. You have slower progression with earlier onset to reach the same pathological end stage over time, and older onset is, has a more rapid disease. And alpha-synuclein pathology is very different in Parkinson's disease and MSA, and we should stop thinking about alpha-synucleans as generalised synucleinopathy. They do involve synuclein, but they're extremely different in how the synuclein can be and whether or not even the synuclein in the slower forms versus the faster forms having those other proteins involved in brain may, that changes the tempo. Uh, synuclein is, is not always the same. And so I'm, I'm not sure if we're doing ourselves a service by thinking of it like that. Thanks very much. This lecture honors the brilliant career and the leadership of David Marsden, and certainly this lecture fits right in that category. So thank you sincerely. We have time for questions, just briefly. Dr. Jankovic. Uh, Mr. Jankovic, Houston, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the recent findings uh, that may explain the difference in the synuclein in PD versus MSA in terms of phosphorylation and transmissibility. And, transmissibility. Uh, and the findings uh, are based on the looking at the epitopes of uh, synuclein, suggesting that the conformation of alpha synuclein in those two uh, diseases is different. And could that explain the differences that you described? Yeah, we've known for a long time that conformation is different. The uh, uh, synuclein in Parkinson's disease actually forms these very structured fibrils. And in the um, oligodendrocytes, the fibril structure is much less uh, uh, solid. It's a more uh, soluble form of uh, alpha-synuclein. So um, thinking about the um, solubility of the more insoluble forms. Uh, the MSA form has much more soluble uh, alpha-synuclein in the inclusions than does the 
Parkinson's form, so it's a much more. Parkinson's packs it into fibrils and does it over a long period of time. Uh, Alpha-synuclein in the MSA is uh, sh more short-lived and much more soluble. We're going to have one more question, and then, but the speakers are going to stay after during the break time. One Jeff, question over here. Jeff Cordova, Chicago. While there's clearly synuclein in glial cells and MSA, what's less clear is that there's mRNA for synuclein in glial cells. Do you think it's coming from the glial cell or elsewhere? Um, so there was an elegant study by the Queen Square group where they actually selected the uh, oligodendrocytes to look at uh, RNA from uh, sufficient numbers of oligodendrocytes, a difficult thing to do. They showed that there is synuclein mRNA in control as well as in MSA mRNA in the oligodendrocytes. The interesting thing is the oligodendrocytes don't actually have more RNA, so it's not upregulated. Uh, in our studies, we actually looked at white matter uh, in controls versus uh, MSA, and we too saw in both controls and uh, MSA uh, synuclein in the white matter um, now that could be mRNA going down the axons, you don't know, but it certainly was in the white matter. And it, it, it was very similar amounts in, in the, to what the single cell studies were saying from uh, the Queen Square. So I think the amounts are about the same as in a neuron, so there's about, uh, about a similar amount of mRNA that's in, but not increased in either the neurons or the, or the oligodendroglia. Yes, I'm going to give the plaque to Glenda and uh, we can applaud and then this session is officially closed. But the speakers will stay shortly after. Oh, Glenda, this Thanks is so fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Oh. No, no, you were right on, you were right on. <laughs> the, the, the problem is...